Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina, just a few minutes down the road from here, about 45 minutes. And uh, friends, I come here this morning to share with you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to share with you the gospel of grace. My friends, I'm here to plead with you concerning your soul and the life of your child. To plead with you not to kill your child, not to take the life of the innocent. Friends, abortion is a great evil in the eyes of God. It procures the wrath of God. It brings about the wrath of God upon you. And so I plead with you this morning to, to flee your sin and to embrace the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to turn from this rebellion, to turn from whatever other sin you are living in as well. I come here not only to plead with you to do those things, but also to believe the gospel message. And I, I'm, I'm out here this morning to make known that gospel, that Christ died for sin according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that all who come to Him will have life. They will have life eternally. Friends, you yourselves do not know when your own life will be demanded of you. You do not know when you will die and stand before your Maker. And friends, many of you, by being here, show yourselves not to be Christ's sheep, not to be a part of the kingdom. And so I plead with you to not lose your soul. To not lose your eternal soul. Because once you die, that is it, my friends. So I plead with you to come to Christ and live. And not only plead, but exhort, because it is a command from God. God commands all men everywhere to repent and to believe the Gospel, to believe upon His Son. He has sent His Son into the world to die upon the cross for the people of God, and all who embrace Christ will have life. Dear friends, I care for you. If you choose life this day, if you choose to spare the life of your child, I commit not only myself but my church to aid you in any way that we possibly can. We will walk through this process with you. We will help you. Not only am I here to offer spiritual help, but practical help as well. I have resources, friends, who are desirous. They desire to adopt your child. If you do not desire to raise that child, at least have enough mercy in your heart to spare its life and not to kill it. Not to kill that little boy or girl. For they are made in the image of God. They are God's image bearers. And you would do well to spare their lives. Because they are gifts from God. They are gifts from above. Precious gifts from God. Scripture says that children are a blessing from the Lord. They are not a curse, and they are not a burden. They are a blessing from on high. So you who are lost, you who are steeped in sin such as fornication, and you've set out this day to commit the sin of murder, you need to repent and believe the Gospel. Ultimately for the glory of God. Because you've been created, all mankind has been created for that purpose. Why did God see fit to make man? To glorify Himself. For His glory all things have been made, friends. So glorify God by coming to His Son. And that is ultimately why I'm out here this morning. To bring God glory in the preaching of the Gospel of His Son, in the exaltation of His Son, in the open air, and even at this house of death, this den of demons, this place where many lives are taken. So may God be glorified as the Gospel goes forth in this dark place. Now the text of Scripture that I would like to highlight before you this morning is found in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, in verse 25. And Paul is writing here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ's death upon the cross for God's people. 
He said this concerning Jesus at the beginning of verse 25. He said, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Friends, you and I need propitiation. What does that word mean? It means wrath has been absorbed. We need the wrath of God to be taken away from us. We need to be rescued from the wrath of God. Otherwise, we will bear it in eternity. In hell, my friends. For man has sinned against God and has earned judgment. He has earned God's wrath to be poured out on him. And the only way that he can possibly be saved from that and enter into heaven when he dies is if atonement takes place, is if propitiation takes place. That is, someone in his room, in his place, bears the wrath of God instead of that sinner. And that is precisely what Christ did upon the cross. And of course, this word is not used often today in modern language. And we ask ourselves, what does it mean? But we must know what it means. We must know what the Bible defines it to mean. We must, because this is the heart of the Gospel. This is the heart of the good news of Christ. And Scripture tells us that we must believe the Gospel. It is the only thing that is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. For everyone who believes. Just as you must believe the Gospel, so must I. And so must every man, woman, and child. We must come to grips with the Biblical Gospel. The biblical message of life that is put forth in the Bible. And that is ultimately the message I want to make known to you this afternoon. Or excuse me, this morning. And so I'd like to consider how Jesus' death procured propitiation. How His death was a propitiation. How it was a satisfaction of divine wrath. Before we do that, I'd like to highlight where Paul is coming from and where he is going here in Romans 3. At the beginning half of Romans 3, he has brought forth the bad news of man's fallenness. And as I said earlier, you have sinned against God, I have sinned against God, all people have sinned against God, and we are separated from God. You who are in this building today, you are separated from God, you are alienated from the life of God, and you need to be made right with God through Christ. But Paul sought to make known the bad news in detail that man is apart from God and that the wrath of God abides on the wicked. See, my friends, we must understand how bad our state outside of the grace of God is so that we may see how glorious God's grace as it has been revealed in Christ. We can only understand God's mercy insofar as we have been brought to be fearful of His wrath. And so Paul does that in the beginning half of Romans 3. And he summarizes all that he has said thus far in Romans 3 and even in Romans chapter 2 and 1. In verse 23 of Romans chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's the bad news, but then he brings forth the good news, verse 24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And that's verse 24. So there is good news that God sent His Son into the world to procure redemption, to bring about forgiveness of sin, to bring about salvation for the people of God. So friends, though you are sinners, yes, and though God's wrath burns against you, yes, God has also revealed mercy. He has shown His love towards sinners in His Son, and all who come to Christ, all who come to God through Christ, will be saved. As it says in John chapter 3, He who believes in Him is not judged, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God.
So therefore, verse 24 brings us to the doorstep of verse 25, which is what I want to highlight this morning concerning Christ's propitiation. So let us look at that. Verse 25, he says, Whom God displayed publicly. My friends, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was not something that was hidden in a corner. It was not something that took place privately. No, it was a public display. It was publicly put forth. And friends, it is there for you today to believe upon. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be your boast. Paul said at the, book, at the end of the book of Galatians, they said, Forbid it that I should boast in anything else but the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, let us not put our boast in anything else. Let us not put our trust in our work, in performance, or in a church, or in a creedal confession even. Let us instead believe upon the cross of Christ. Make that our glory and our boast. Make that that which we look to for life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Friends, Christ has been lifted up in the sight of all peoples so that they might look, so that they might turn from sin and embrace the Savior. God did not do this in secrecy. He did not do it as it were covered under a blanket. But no, it is exposed, it is open. The treasure chest of the Gospel is swung open and all can be made rich spiritually in Christ. So come. However, you are dead in sin and you cannot come. You are lost and you will not come. You hate God and the only way you will come is that the Spirit of God raises you to spiritual life and enables you to come and enables you to repent and to believe the Gospel. That's the only way you'll ever come. It is the only way. Christ is He whom God displayed publicly. He put it on display. Paul could have used the terminology that God had caused it to happen publicly. But he says He displayed it publicly. That is, it was open. It was wide. So that all might see it. And then he says, He displayed Him publicly as what? He says, as a propitiation. As a propitiation. My friends, propitiation is what you and I both need desperately. Otherwise, we will be eternally lost. Otherwise, our sin, our lying, and our thievery, or perhaps even the sin of abortion, will bring us to hell. The only way that we can be freed from this is if propitiation is accomplished for us. That is, wrath is absorbed. That is, the wrath of the Father is appeased. That He is pleased by a sacrifice. But not just any sacrifice, but it must be a perfect sacrifice. It must be a, a, an absolutely righteous sacrifice. It must be a proper sacrifice in order for it to be accepted by the Father. For as Scripture tells us, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, as some of you perhaps know, happened in the Old Testament where many various animals were killed to supposedly take away sin, but it was only symbolic, it was only typological, pointing to the fact that Christ would one day accomplish salvation, that He would one day lay His life down for His people as the Lamb of God, which He certainly is. And it cannot be a propitiation which is accomplished by a mere man. It must be a propitiation which is accomplished by someone who is truly God and truly man. Very God and very man. And that is Christ. He has two natures, my friends. He is the true God fully and He is also truly man fully. And therefore, He can stand between God and man as mediator. 
Therefore he can accomplish propitiation. For he died for man and paid an infinite price as God upon that cross. Propitiation. That is, that the wrath of the Father that we deserve to be poured out on us in hell, that being the elect, was unleashed on Christ. Christ upon the cross was counted as a sinner. He was treated as a lawbreaker, though He Himself was perfect. He took ownership of the sins of the people of God. So every sin that I myself have ever committed and will ever commit was credited to Jesus' account and the Father upon the cross as it were a call to His Son that He might pay that debt. That He might put away my debt. And He did that very thing, friends. And perhaps the question is in your heart, how do I know that Christ has put away my debt? How do I know that Christ took ownership of my sin? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and then you will know. I cannot guarantee you that He truly did put away your debt upon the cross. For He did not die for every person. He died for a specific group. That being His church, His people. That being His bride, He did not die for the entirety of the human race, but a select people that was scattered across the world. As it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. This, this group of people that Christ died for was scattered across the entirety of the inhabited earth. And Christ purchased redemption for these men, these women, these children. Friends, do not commit this sin of abortion. God says, Thou shalt not kill. You shall not murder. You shall not take the life of the innocent. Friends, do not sin against God. God has providentially brought about my being here this morning to be as it were a conscience for this place to call out and to plead and to rebuke and to exhort. Yes, friends, I rebuke you with all authority that the Word of God gives me as I stand upon it. You must turn from this sin. Do not slaughter your child. You have no right over that child's life. God is the Creator. He is the sustainer of life. And He commands both the day of one's birth and death. Do not take that which belongs to God into your own hands and think that you are the sovereign. Think that you can define destiny. Friends, God is sovereign. God is the life giver and the life taker. Let us not be so proud as to think that those children are worthless. They are children from the Lord. They are blessings from God. They are rewards from the Holy One. And you would do well to spare the life of your child. You will not regret such a thing. You will not regret sparing your child's life and seeing that precious little one as they grow up through this life. You will not regret it. For this I know with certainty. Christ Jesus is the one whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. And then Paul says this, the propitiation is in His blood through faith. My friends, that is that Christ shed His blood upon the cross so that, his sins, so that the sins of His people might be forgiven. What does it mean that we are saved by the blood of Christ? That is that His life was required of Him. It wasn't just that He had to suffer. He had to die. For God says in the Old Testament, the life of the creature is in its blood. Friends, blood represents life. And Christ's life was required of Him, and so His blood was spilled out, symbolizing that His life was being required of Him. 
so that the lives of His people might be spared. So that sinners like you might be spared. So do not trample the precious offer of the Gospel underfoot. Instead, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come ye who are weary and heavy laden, and Christ will give you rest. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He is gentle. He is humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Even you medical doctors and you workers in this building of death, this building of murder, this house of demons, you as well must repent and believe the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you will have life eternally. Let us not shed the blood of the innocent. Rather, let us look to Christ who was innocent and whose blood was shed on behalf of His people and let us look to that shedding of blood as our, as our salvation. For we have been justified by His blood, those of us who have been saved. As Paul says later in Romans 5.9, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. It is only in Jesus Christ. It is exclusive. It is not in you or in your religious works. It is not in any other religious leader. It is in Christ who not only died, but vindicated Himself, was raised on the third day, and is alive today and forevermore. And He is exalted in glory at the right hand of the Majesty on high. And He lives to make intercession for those who will draw near to God through Him. And so come to Christ lest you perish in the way. And this propitiation in Christ's blood is through faith. That is, it is received by faith alone. Do not think that you can offer up to God some sort of religious merit. That you can commit this sin and you can live a life of sin and then you can go to church and pray some prayers and it's all okay. Or that you can go and confess to a priest and then it is all absolved. Or that you yourself can simply try and amend your ways and you are therefore made right with your Creator. Friends, you must have faith in the finished work of Christ to be saved. And it must be an exclusive faith. Saving faith is exclusive. It is discriminative. You must absolutely trust in Christ alone outside of any materious work. Christ Jesus' work is sufficient to save. If you think that you can justify yourself you are far from the kingdom. If you think that you can save yourself, you are far from the kingdom. For Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Friends, rest in Christ. Do not rest upon your work rest upon the finished work of Christ. Lest the wrath of God be unleashed upon you. Holy is God indeed. The One who created us. The One who made us. The One who formed us in our mother's wombs. My friends, God is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct eternal persons, yet one divine being essence in nature. And that being essence in nature in no way is divided. Friends, God is holy as well. As we find in Isaiah 6, in the Psalms, in Leviticus, Chapter 11, we find that God declares Himself to be sanctified, that is, to be holy, to be set apart from perversion and wickedness. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate, but He is also just. For we find in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, the Lord is speaking here to Moses upon, the, upon Mount Sinai. 
And he says these words, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And I just want to stop right there and say this. Friends, God is slow to anger. He has grace and He even shows a measure of love toward the sinner. But friends, that is not to be taken lightly. That ought to move you to repent. The mercy and kindness of God as it is revealed toward you ought to motivate you to humble yourself and to repent and to believe the Gospel message. It is not something that we can look at and then trample it under our feet and say, okay, God's merciful so we can do whatever we want. Certainly not. But look at what verse 7 says right after it says He is abounding in loving kindness and truth. It says, Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That is because He is a just God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. And He hates sin. He has a burning indignation against the sinner. And in His holiness, God has put forth His law, His Ten Commandments, which you and I both have broken. Those commands show us God's holy character. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not murder. These commands show us God's standard, but we ourselves cannot keep it. We have lied and stolen. We have blasphemed, that is, we have used God's name in an ir irreverent manner. And my friends, today, here you are, setting out to murder. Setting out to transgress God's law. And therefore, it is revealed that you are a lawbreaker. Sin is transgression of the law. God also, He also forbid any sort of adultery, any sort of sexual immorality. Yet many of you have committed sexual immorality, fornication, adultery. You say, I've never committed adultery. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman... With lust, you commit adultery in your heart. God sees the mind, friends. He sees the heart. He sees the perverted inward deeds. And He sees that inwardly we are not good, that we do not have an island of righteousness in the sea of our sin. No, my friends, we are sinners, corrupt to the core, and dead in sin, haters of God, enemies of God, at war with God, and we will not come to Christ. We cannot because we will not come. And therefore we are condemned to hell. To the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, I come out here because I don't want you to go to hell. But I know that Scripture says if you are outside of Christ, if you are outside of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, then friends, you do not know Him and you're on the road to destruction. You're on the road to hell. Jesus said concerning the wicked in Matthew chapter 25, 46, He said, These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so we are without hope. We are without any hope in and of ourselves. You are without hope. You live a hopeless life. A purposeless life. However, my friends, God is rich in mercy. As we find in Ephesians 2, it says, But God being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. My friends, God has set out to save a people unto Himself. 
it, before the world was made, the Father predestined a group unto salvation. He set aside His church. He set aside those whom He would save. And He commissioned His Son. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ as it were. He gave Him a charge. Die for this people. Suffer for this people. And therefore be rewarded. And Christ agreed to do so. He says in John 10 that this, this people... The Father has given to Him. It is a, it is a gift unto the, unto the Son from the Father. And so, my friends, the world was made and the ages passed. Thousands of years elapsed. And then we find, about 2,000 years ago, Christ was born. Paul says in Galatians 4.4 4, this way, he says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The fullness of the time, that is the right time, Christ Jesus came into the world. The eternal God took upon Himself flesh and dwelt among men. He fulfilled the law that you and I broke. So you murderous fornicators... You lawbreakers, you liars and thieves, you murderous doctors, you've broken the law. However, Christ comes and has come and He fulfills the law. He said in Matthew 5, 17 that that is what He came to do, to fulfill all righteousness, or to fulfill the law. He says in Matthew 3, I came to fulfill all righteousness. And so He does so. He pleases the Father. He lives a perfect life. And then He goes to the cross and is stretched upon the cross as the Lamb of God and bears the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. He is treated as if a sinner. The innocent one dies the death of the guilty. He is treated as a lawbreaker, as a liar, a thief, a murderous person. Though He Himself never sinned, He is given a crown of thorns. He is made a public mockery. He is nailed to the cross there. And there He dies for His people. 2 Peter 2.24 says, And He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so we might live to sin and die, and, excuse me, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. Christ Jesus bore the sins of the people of God and the wrath of God against that people, just as I mentioned earlier. And so that when Christ died, the wrath of the Father was satisfied, Isaiah 53.10, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. And Christ died. He purchased salvation. He purchased redemption for His people. Christ Jesus is Lord. He is Lord, my friends. And all who come to Him will have life. He died for His people. He died to satisfy the wrath of the Father. And three days later, Christ Jesus, He was raised. Christ is alive today, friends. He is the living God. And He will never die again. Death has no power over Him. He is the resurrection and the life. John 11.25 says, Jesus here speaking, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. That is, Christ is alive, my friends. He has the inherent power to raise himself up. Christ Jesus is the only true God. And 40 days later, Christ was exalted. 
in glory at the right hand of the Father. And He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God. Through Him He reigns as King, as the King of glory. And He, my friends, has given a decree, and it is that you must repent and believe upon Him, that you must embrace Him, you must turn from sin, and turn to the Savior. And He says, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. You must repent and believe. Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance is simply we see that we've sinned against God, we see that we are rebels, and we are broken over that, we are disgusted with our sin. And my friends, we see I cannot save myself, I must look to Christ. And faith is that. Faith is looking to Christ through the eye of faith. Faith is believing that God truly did accomplish, salva accomplish salvation for His people. That Christ truly did die for His people and was raised on the third day. It is believing the promises of God. Taking God at His word. And these things are not something you can procure. These are things that you cannot muster up. You're dead in sin. And you will not come. God has to grant repentance and faith to you. But for those whom God does grant repentance and faith to, they are, their sins are forgiven because of Christ's work. For the one who believes upon Christ, his sin is not only forgiven because of Christ's work on the cross, but he is credited with the righteousness of Christ. That is, he is considered as having lived Jesus' life. Because Christ was considered at the cross as having lived His. Jesus takes upon Himself my law-breaking, and I receive the righteousness of Christ, the justitia alienum, the foreign righteousness that is not my own, that Jesus works for, and it is given to me, and I take ownership of it before the Father, and the Father wraps me in that and sees me as having perfectly performed as Jesus did. So not only is a sinner forgiven, but regarded as a law-keeper rather than a lawbreaker. Praise be to God, this is all by grace. And this salvation is forever, it is never lost. It is by God's grace, God keeps His people in His grace. Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith. Titus says, uh, Paul writes in Titus, he says, for the grace of God has appeared. That is the unmerited favor of God. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to clean up yourself. You don't have to try and make your life better. Just come to Christ and He will save you from your sin. Don't continue in your sin. Don't murder your child. Don't commit abortion. Don't commit the sin of abortion. Instead, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And you men... You guys who say that you're a man, you need to man up and protect your woman. You need to protect your wife. You need to protect your girlfriend. Don't bring her to this place of death. You need to protect that little child that is in her womb and guard the life of the innocent as a man ought to do. And this salvation is not only a salvation which simply accomplishes a right standing before God, but it accomplishes a changed life. Those who are saved by God's grace, those who repent and believe the gospel,
are not only saved by God and regarded as righteous, but they are saved from present slavery to sin. They are made slaves of Christ. Friends, you are either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. You're either a slave of iniquity and transgression or you're a slave of righteousness. And friends, many of you, probably all of you, are slaves to sin. You need to be made a slave of Christ. For when you are a bond slave of Christ, then you are truly free. Those who are saved have a new nature. If you were saved, you would not be here. You would not be here to slaughter your child. When God saves a man, He has changed. He now hates the things He once loved. He now hates the sin that He once lived in. And He now loves the things that He once hated. He loves the Word of God and prayer and meeting with the fellow saints. He loves to share the Gospel with the lost because God has done a work in Him. God has raised Him to spiritual life. The false convert will not be in such a state. And many people who say they know Christ will be turned away on the day of judgment because they never knew Him. They said they knew Him, but they did not truly. They said they knew the love of God, but they did not. They were hypocrites. Many, Jesus says, on the day of judgment, will say to me, Lord, Lord, and He says, I will say to them, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. Friends, many will hear such a a charge from the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will hear such words flow from the lips of our blessed Lord on that day of judgment because they were never changed. If you want to know whether someone is truly a Christian, look at their life. Look at the way they live. Look at their delight. You may say you know Christ, but look at what you think about most. Look at what your heart is after. Is it God or is it yourself and your worldly pleasures? If so, you know not Christ. Works are not the cause of salvation, but they are surely the evidence of it. We do not work so that we might be saved. We work because we have been saved. We work because we have been justified by the free mercy of God. Therefore, if you have no fruit in your life to bear evidence to the fact that God has changed you, you have not been changed. And you can be sure of that. This salvation that God brings about for His people is a salvation that is by grace. Paul says in Romans 5, 2, speaking of Christ, he says, Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We, those who are in Christ, stand in the grace of God. They are in a right standing by grace alone and they are, they are continually in that state by grace alone. Why is it such? So that God receives the glory. So that God is praised. So that God is honored. Ultimately, all things are made for that end. That is, to bring God glory. All things are made for that goal. To bring glory to the Holy One. That is the chief end of all things. That is the chief end of your life and of mine. The glory of God. Every person in this world, every event that has ever happened, every star in the sky, every celestial body, the entirety of the visible universe, 93 billion miles, our light years across, excuse me, has been made to the glory of God, has been made to either bring God direct glory or perhaps indirectly to bring His name glory. And souls have been made for that purpose as well. Some vessels of mercy and some vessels of wrath. God is glorified in sending sinners to hell just as He is glorified in bringing His people to glory, bringing His people to salvation and ultimately to heaven. Either way, God will receive the glory. For God is jealous for the glory. Paul speaks of the glory of God at the end of Romans 11. After having thoroughly covered the issue of salvation, the issue of God's sovereignty over salvation, he says this, verse 33, Oh, the depth 
of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments, and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who is first given to Him, that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Indeed, to God be the glory in all things forever. Amen. You poor lost souls. You unconverted people. And my friends, I call you that because I care for you. I plead with you. I beg you to repent and to embrace the Son of God. For you to renounce your life of sin. For you to renounce this sin of abortion. To turn away and not to commit it. To leave this place. And to endeavor to glorify God in all that you do. Firstly, by trusting in His Son alone for your salvation. I plead with you not to continue on in this hopeless life that you are living, this worthless life, this life that really has no goal and no end, this depressing life you live, where you just simply indulge yourself with worldly lusts, ultimately just waiting for the decades to pass and one day for you to die and go to hell. Instead, live your life to the glory of God. A life lived unto God's glory is a life well lived. So repent and believe. And I promise you, I and my church, we will help you. If you choose life for your child. If you choose to spare the life of your child, we will help you as much as we possibly can. To the best of our abilities because we value human life. Because it is a gift from God Most High. And you who say that you know Christ, but you are here this day, you religious hypocrites, look at yourselves, look at your lives, and know that you are lost. Don't continue deluding yourselves. Don't continue to deceive yourselves. Look at your life and see that your fruit shows that the tree is corrupt. That the fruit that grows on this tree is corrupt. The tree of your life is corrupt, my friends. You are now not founded upon the rock of Christ. I do not care what religious experience you've had in the past. You need to be saved, truly. And if anyone is in the sound of my voice in either directions, and you do know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have seen, you have examined yourself, and you say, I... I do bear fruit of eternal life. I do desire holiness. I hate sin. I delight in my Lord. I trust in Him alone for my eternal redemption. Praise be to God. Rest in this gospel, brethren, and preach it. Preach it unto the lost. Unto lost souls so that they might be saved and brought into the kingdom. So, my friends, we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 that Christ accomplished propitiation. That He, in His death upon the cross, brought about eternal redemption for His people by satisfying the wrath of the Father against their sin. We have seen in other scriptures how we ourselves have sinned against God. We have offended Him by our sin. But God, in His mercy, and still upholding His holiness, sent His Son into the world to die for sinners. And He was raised on the third day. And for whoever will come to Him, they will be received. They will be given eternal life, redemption and remission of sins. All by God's grace, ultimately that God might receive the glory. And that is the chief end of all things and the chief end of this very sermon, to bring God glory. So may God be glorified in your life, in my life, 
in the lives of all people, all things, as I said earlier, may He be glorified in them. May the Father, Son, and Spirit, the triune God, receive all glory, honor, and praise in all things forevermore. Amen.